Hello. Our story begins inside of Palpatine's office on the night of his greatest triumph. His new apprentice, Lord Vader, had left the office to go to the Jedi Temple and wipe out the Jedi. For Palpatine, he saw this as a moment to exact his revenge for the centuries of silent suffering that the Sith had to endure. He watched as the door closed behind Vader and said he's looked down at his desk. A smile crossed his face. The rise of the Sith would be complete with this action. The execution of Order 66 was meant to be perfect, as long as it wiped out the most important members of the Jedi Order. Then that's all that mattered. To Palpatine, it seemed poetic to wipe the Jedi from the universe in the blink of an eye. It was what the Jedi thought happened to the Sith millennia ago. He stepped to the desk and pulled out his communication device, preparing to reach out to the numerous clone commanders across the galaxy. Surely with 10,000 Jedi in the galaxy, he couldn't kill them all, but at least 95% would be fitting to him. Anything less than that would be just a surplus. It started. Jedi across the galaxy were slain by their clone commanders. From Plo Koon to Kiadimundi, on the planet Utapau, Obi-Wan Kenobi was plastered to the side of the mountain. His lizard wasn't much more than a stain. The only thing left of Kenobi was his kyber crystal. Even for non-Jedi, Ahsoka Tano, her fate was sealed when Commander Rex turned around and blasted her in the head, dropping her lifeless body on the bridge of the Venator. This trend continued throughout the entire galaxy, whether it be Jera Tapau being blasted down by his men and Cal Kestis believing he escaped via the escape pod, though the moment he settled in with his dead master, he heard the ringing of a thermal imploder and his vessel exploded from the inside out, killing him instantly. On another battlefront, Jedi Master Depa Balaba worked her hardest to keep her paddle and Caleb Doom safe, but a blast through the back of his chest had him dropping to the cold ground. The last thing he heard was his master crying out to him but for her untimely death shortly after his. On the battlefront at Boz Biddy, talented Jedi Master Quinlan Voss was obliterated by an ATTE, and not far from there on Kashyyyk, a number of Jedi took their final breaths. Luminar Unduli was crushed by a juggernaut tank, and Grandmaster Yoda, while defending himself from the first couple of clones, was bombarded by a passing by Arc 170. This killed Chewbacca and Tarful as well. Inside the Jedi Temple, the clones completely surrounded the complex. The Coruscant Guard, with information provided by Skywalker, locked down the entire facility. Every member who tried to escape, whether it be a band of younglings, Tara Sanube, or Coleman Kaj, were executed with great precision. Anakin wiped out any Jedi he came across inside the temple. There were no survivors. Anyone who strayed away from him were either cut down by clone troopers or the future Grand Inquisitor. What a perfect scenario for the rise of the Sith. The age of the Jedi had just come to a conclusion. It was over, and the rise of the Sith had begun. After a short moment with Padme at her residence on the other side of the city, Anakin made his way for Mustafar. He had a mission to complete, and part one of said mission was already completed. During the occupation of the Jedi Temple, Senator Bail Organa was killed by accident when he arrived at the mass execution. The clones reported the slain senator to the Emperor's office, and all he said is that he wanted them to make it look like the Jedi had done it, which of course they had no problem doing. By the end of 24 hours, every single known Jedi across the galaxy had been killed. Of course, there were individuals who abandoned the Order like Eeth Koth, but he was no longer technically a Jedi. There was also this one Jedi on Adalim, named Kirak Infla, but he was on a Barish Vow, which ensured he disconnected himself from the Jedi Order, so he was essentially not a part of the wider Order as a whole. While the execution of Order 66 would have initially left a hundred or so Jedi left, including a couple council members and powerful future Jedi, Jedi. This time around, there were no signs of the Jedi. The few individuals who escaped the temple were hunted down like wild game, and only killed to be shown off like trophies. This was specific with one Wookiee youngling named Gungi. The clones held his lifeless corpse up by his head like he was big game. They prided themselves in killing the first Wookiee Jedi seen since the High Republic. What an honor. On Mustafar, Lord Vader had completed the second part of his mission and awaited orders from his master, which would be enacted on shortly. Palpatine had other plans. He had to make sure Vader submitted himself to the dark side of the Force, and with the Jedi seemingly destroyed, he had to blame someone. So who could Palpatine blame? Well, no one other than Anakin. Nothing would make a better Sith than a Sith who fed off their own hatred for themselves. Palpatine would make Padme's survival seem positive initially, but make him feel like he caused her suffering by helping her live. But all the while, Palpatine would make himself 
irreplaceable. He would make Anakin entirely reliant on him for the rest of his life, and to make Padme's death feel like his own fault. It was so brilliantly twisted that only someone as convoluted as Sidious could come up with it. Nothing would stop the return of the Sith. After about a fold down, Mustafar Palpatine would request Lord Vader to return to Coruscant. By this time, Anakin was donning yellow Sith eyes, and there was no fluctuation in them. He cemented himself in the dark side of the Force, and he was prepared to welcome his new child into the galaxy with Padme. Nothing could go wrong. He did everything he was told to do. Upon Vader's arrival to Coruscant, he went to the Emperor's office, where he was congratulated for his hard work and his dedication. He told Vader to join his wife until their children were born. He would ensure the rise of the Empire would be complete, and when they were born, he would request Vader back to his presence. Young Vader had a question for his new master, which was, what if there was complications with the birthing process, and Palpatine expressed that he would be near whenever Vader needed him. Their bond hadn't changed. It was always the case, and it would always be the case. Vader bowed respectfully and left. Palpatine understood how the Force worked. He understood that the Force acts in rhythms. Being that he understood this, he realized that the child Anakin was about to have with Padme was going to be the Force's way of sending a new Chosen One to stop him. No one would ever be as powerful as Anakin, and Palpatine also knew that, which is why he turned him to the dark side. Even if Palpatine couldn't reach immortality, he could curse the galaxy with the reign of the Sith for forever. And as the Force works as it does, Palpatine would need to ensure the corruption of Anakin's children, be a leech the same way he was to young Skywalker, and turn him or her to the dark side, eradicate the hope as it were. Palpatine already had initiatives in place that he would enact once everything settled down for more than two minutes to ensure that there would be no more force users to challenge him. There would be powerful beings across the galaxy for him to exploit in due time. Also, speaking of exploitation, his longtime favorite apprentice was, again, back from the dead. Maul was captured by the men of the 501st, and even better, he was trapped inside of a Mandalorian sarcophagus. With Vader away, Palpatine decided he would keep Maul around for future uses, which only terrified the living soul out of Maul. Regardless, Rex and his men were to deliver Maul to the Coruscant Guard, which would take Maul to Mount Tantus on Wayland. The base was a secret facility that he didn't want Vader to learn about. There are plenty of plans revolving around the creation of clones, and Palpatine would use Maul for those plans. He was an adequate enough force user to test and experiment on, especially with the blood and magic of Mother Talzin coursing through him. Oh, what joy. In the next couple of days, Padme would give a seemingly pleasant birth. Sidious and Vader would be present, which for Padme was a little weird. Having the Emperor be there with them, she didn't really like it too much, but she was left in a helpless predicament, especially because of the giving birth process, and Anakin's demands to do so, for his superstitions. While everything on the surface was going fine, Palpatine used the Force as a means to rip apart veins from the inside out, letting her slowly bleed out from the inside. It would take time to actually kill her, and by the time she felt anything, <laughs> it would be too late to save her. It was the perfect plan to make Anakin feel like a failure. Palpatine ensured this worked by ripping pieces of flesh apart near critical arteries, and even creating a small incision inside of Padme's brain to make sure her brain would shut off at some point. Anakin had no clue. He had no reason to have one. Palpatine congratulated him and told him to enjoy a few more moments with his wife before his real missions as Lord Vader began. Anakin was perfectly fine with that, and Padme was overjoyed to have Palpatine away from them so they could have their privacy. They eventually did return to their residence and begin a whole new parenting process. This, in Palpatine's mind, changed the game. There was the potential for a dyad here. It wasn't written in the stars, but the power of a dyad was like life itself, which could be very useful for immortality. But Palpatine had to be patient. There was no reason to believe they were force sensitive yet. They had to show signs first. Of course, there was a 99.9% .9 chance that they were indeed force sensitive, but Palpatine had to account for any scenario as he continued his grand master plan, which is also why he accounted for the possibility of a dyad. For months, everything would be silent, maybe a little too silent. With the Jedi gone, including Eeth Koth and Kirak, their religion was dead. Palpatine ripped apart their texts and burned any remnant of them, aside from building a throne inside of their ancient temple because nothing beats a little passive-aggressive victory parade. Little did Palpatine, Vader, or the rest of the galaxy realize there was a darkness falling, and it was darker than the reign of the Sith. 
During this period, Camino fell. The clones had been cancelled out, which had Lord Vader hunting down traitors to show loyalty of course. Without Jedi to hunt, it would be like headhunting. How many clones could Vader kill? He had to prove his loyalty somehow, which came when he had to execute clone commander Rex. It was a public execution too, something Palpatine relished in. It was held in the Imperial military complex on Coruscant in front of all the clones. Anakin wielded his red lightsaber and broke it down on Rex's back. This was of course after he captured the clone by removing both of his hands and mortally wounding him in the abdomen. The dark side is always relatively unforgiving. He eventually had to track down Cody too, and with the help of the Grand Inquisitor, led to the deaths of a squad of rebel clones and the former Clone Force 99, which wasn't pleasant, but it was a mission completed for the Emperor. After Vader and Grand Inquisitor gutted Hunter, Tech, Wrecker, and Echo, they took Omega and brought her to Coruscant where she was sent back to Mount Tantus to join her brother Crosshair and a number of other clones from Kamino. With Maul being on Tantus, the cloning process was going a lot quicker, but there was also something aiding that. Because Palpatine was essentially Uncle Palpatine or Grandpa Palps, for the twins, he was able to get a midichlorian test on them, which he did. But he was mostly getting their DNA, and enough DNA to send to Tantus for the cloning process. Sidious also knew that the ticking time bomb inside of Padme was about to go off, which would make Anakin go psycho. Luckily, there was a stirring in the Outer Rim that Sidious wanted Vader to investigate. The truth is, not even Palpatine knew what it was, but it was perfect timing. At the moment, the Empire was ramping up its militarization, and Vader was placed on a brand new Imperial Star Destroyer, which was escorted by a group of Venators. In reality, Sidious expected nothing much from this, he just assumed that it was a group of pirates, but it got the attention of a coalition of star systems, and it was a loud enough cry for help that Palpatine actually thought it worthwhile to send Vader down there. During the months building up the Padme's death, Sidious insinuated that without Anakin, he wouldn't be able to save her. This had two effects, giving Anakin a bit of ego, but also making him feel his wife's life was in his hands, which in reality, nothing was. When Vader's fleet arrived in the Outer Rim, he was a little bit confused. The Force wasn't out of balance or dark and like it usually was, it just wasn't there. The galaxy was full of Force-sensitive beings. As the Jedi teachings taught, every living being had the Force, it binds the galaxy together, and while not every single one of the 400 quadrillion sentients had the ability to use a Force like the Jedi or the Sith, they still had it. Each and every planet and moon and system had the Force, but this was something else. What did they come across? Vader reached out to his master, but the request wasn't answered. Where could he be? Vader took a squad of clone commandos and stormtroopers down to the surface of the planet. He didn't really care for the stormtroopers at all, but as long as they got the job done, then it didn't really matter, did it? Next to Vader was the Grand Inquisitor, but he was instructed to remain inside the Star Destroyer and inform him if anything odd came up. Vader didn't have much respect for Grand Inquisitor, but the Emperor had him around just in case there were any survivors of the Purge. Without any Jedi having survived, there was no one to become an Inquisitor, and no one for the Grand Inquisitor to lead, so he essentially became an Enforcer. He wasn't good enough to be an apprentice or an assassin, so he did things that were far below Vader. When Vader landed on the ground, his troops fanned out. It was eerily silent. The stormtroopers moved in, first as the clone commandos kept close to Vader. They were recon, but in Vader's eyes, they had much more value than these easily replaceable civilian signups. The planet felt dead. In a way, these were a people that reached out to the Empire for help, and the Empire was here, but it looked like nothing had happened. Nothing but a galactic scale ding dong ditch. The weirdest thing for Anakin is it felt like walking into a cave. The lights were off, but someone was home. It was chaotic and terrifying at the same time. Skywalker never felt so disconnected from the Force, because the Force seemingly died here, and the planet was at a loss. Vader told the troopers to carry on as he reached out to his master once more and got nothing back. He then communicated to the Grand Inquisitor asking that he monitor the surface for life forms and continue to try and search and reach out to the Emperor. Grand Inquisitor obliged, and Vader ended the communication. He turned and looked for his men, and it was so silent. The eeriness of his first landing on this planet dissipated, and it felt like death had beset every living being on the planet. It was bizarre to say the least. Vader called out to the troopers, but no one responded. He called out to one of the commandos. One of their names was Fixer. His brother from Delta Squad was situated on a training facility and recently moved to Mount Tantus to watch over Nalase and the Prime Minister of Kamino. 
Before Vader got a response, he heard a stormtrooper cry out in pain. Vader ignited his weapon and saw a number of armored individuals walk out from the smoke. The pilots on the LAATs requested Vader to get back to the ship, and he silenced them. His crimson blade sat next to him. He felt powerful for a moment, but these creatures were not also backing down. Anakin was taught in the Jedi Temple of thousands upon thousands of sentient species in the galaxy. He'd never seen these before. He figured that he should have known about them because they were certainly civilized enough to say the least. Skywalker stood firmly, and they fired at him, without even trying to create a treaty. He blocked their strikes and reached out with the Force, attempting to choke them, but it didn't work. A chill shot down his body. He didn't understand how this could be, so he chose the alternative. He ran up to them and swung down onto one of them with his lightsaber, and the weapon just bounced off. The individual in front of him grabbed him by the face and slammed his weapon into Anakin's nose, completely breaking it. Vader fell to the ground and looked up holding his nose. From the other side, he saw one of the creatures holding Fixer by the neck and dragging him out of the smoke and the brush. He was flailing like a disobedient child getting punished. He was begging for help, and as Vader reached out to help, he heard the creature's fist dig into Fixer's neck. He bellowed out a terrible howl, and he began to bleed out before it was completely silenced by a swift twist, and it put him out of his misery. Vader jumped up and ran to the ships. He told the LAATs to get him off this wretched planet. As they made their way back to the vessel, he told the Grand Inquisitor to prepare a bombing run on the surface. Inquisitively, Grand Inquisitor asked why they were bombing the surface with no lifeforms on it. Anakin could have killed him in this moment, but he had favor with the Emperor. He just told him to do it, and he listened, instructing a wing of ARC-170s to head down to Vader's location. The LAATs flew up past the wing of bombers, and the surface was lit into an array of flames and explosions. Vader couldn't help but feel confused on what had happened. When he got back to the ship, he immediately had his nose get worked on. It hurt like nothing else. While he was waiting for the medical droid to finish his job, the ship rocked back and forth. Grand Inquisitor requested him to the bridge. Vader leapt up and sped down the hallways until he got to the bridge of the vessel. When he looked out, he was horrified. A fleet larger than anything he'd seen before was releasing a barrage of fighters. The clones and Imperials were releasing their own waves of fighters to provoke a defense. Both Vader and Grand Inquisitor knew it wouldn't be worth their time to try and fight it off. They would likely die if they tried to fight off this force. They turned to each other and both simultaneously agreed that this fight was not one they could win. Vader ordered a full-scale retreat, but it was too late for the order. The first Venator dropped out of the sky, into dead space. The Star Destroyer had enough shields to escape the carnage, but the Venators were either completely destroyed or left without engines. Those who didn't explode immediately were boarded, and when they were boarded, they transmitted everything, all the terrifying accounts back to Coruscant of what they encountered before they died. The sole survivor of the brief encounter was the Star Destroyer. If it made anyone else feel any better, the Star Destroyer did take out a couple of long support ships, but it wasn't much to brag about. Vader tried to contact his master once again, and when Sidious answered, there was a glum demeanor about the Sith Lord. Vader asked what had happened, and Sidious, with a great sorrow and regret, told his apprentice that Padme couldn't be saved. He tried, but he couldn't save her without Vader's help. The young Sith asked what happened, and Sidious expressed that shortly after she gave birth, it seemed like she began internally bleeding. It wasn't enough for anyone to notice during the process. Vader raged, but he was distracted before ripping the ship apart. Sidious asked why Vader called him so many times. Was the operation successful? He shook his head. He told his master that there was a new opponent, though there were no records of the species existing in the current galaxy. He suggested that the crew on the Star Destroyer were checking every database available, but there was nothing they could find as of now. Sidious requested all the information provided to him immediately. He would discuss this when he returned to Coruscant. Sidious informed Skywalker that the twins were being taken care of at the moment. They were with him inside of his office, and would be here until Vader returned. The young Sith Lord told his master that he was greatly appreciative for it, and Sidious simply smiled and ended the transmission. Sidious wasn't actually anywhere near his office. He was actually inside of the lair on the far side of the city. He used blood samples from Padme's corpse and the one he took from Anakin earlier in his life and combined them into the Force altar he had before him. He was using an ancient spell to draw on both Padme and Anakin's entities. But not just theirs, the twins as well. Palpatine could do one of two things. He could use it for cloning, or he could use it for turning the twins into his loyal servants. He chose the latter. 
Why? Because it was a quicker way to achieve results. Cloning could be a very 50-50 scenario. If it went wrong, he would have to get back the twins and try this operation again. He'd rather corrupt them now as infants. This would in essence undo the bond created to both parents and create it with Palpatine. It would replicate the skin-to-skin -skin contact that Luke and Leia had with their mother after they were born. In an even sicker way, it would be what Palpatine's bond with Anakin was, which was along the lines of a trauma bond. What a sick trick. By the time Anakin arrived on Coruscant, he wouldn't even know of any of this. Palpatine would be in his office surrounded by a number of Imperial officers. Moff Tarkin was present as well as Commander Krennic and a number of other suck-ups. Sidious had all the panels spread out across the room as they watched numerous footages taken and recovered during the battle, even the footage from the LAATs from the surface of the planet they were on. They noted that they were seemingly resistant to lightsabers and the Force, but also couldn't be harmed by blasters, or at least it seemed that way. One of the officers in the room suggested that maybe they were weak in the facial area, where there was no protection. While they were talking about this potential threat, they acknowledged that the new Imperial Star Destroyer seemed like a perfect fit for this virus. Cities grinned, an evil, sinister smile. Ah yes, perfect to expand the military. He could make the military so large, it could never be stopped. Even better, he could convince the population to suffer through a period of martial law to ensure the protection. Regardless of how true or not it was, it would be the perfect way for ensuring their loyalty to him. Sidious informed the Imperials to take the largest fleet of clone-operated infantry and navy and send them to that quadrant of the galaxy to ensure they recorded the footage, showed the destruction of the Venator and clone fleet, and then the effectiveness of the Imperial fleet. One of the officers misunderstood and Masameda explained it. The Empire would send a fleet of clones to fight off this threat. The clones would lose a number of their forces, showing their inadequacy again, and then the Empire, backed with its stormtroopers and Star Destroyers would arrive to save the day. It would prove to be the most successful budget stunt in the history of the galaxy. But to show the effect of clone troopers be so ineffective would tell the entire galaxy that winning the Clone Wars did not guarantee longevity. It was a ploy to ensure no power left the grip of the all-powerful Emperor. Sidious loved the idea. He could see which of his officers were worth keeping around and which ones should be killed off for not being talented enough to stand up to this foe. Vader arrived at the end of the conversation and got the Sidious aside like his little errand boy. That's how some of the officers saw it at least. Once the officers had the directive, Sidious walked with Skywalker over towards where his children were and told his student that he would not be going on this mission. He pleaded to go, and Sidious expressed that someone else would be going instead. Sidious had some rough clones ready to go. Some of them showed the ability to use the Force. They were already being sent to the Outer Rim to locate the threat they were facing. Sidious didn't express any of this to Vader. Instead, he pretended to show care for his student, telling him to take time to mourn the loss of his loved one. One. He patted his apprentice on the shoulder and told him if he wanted time alone, he would watch over the children for him. Vader nodded his head and left. The door closed behind Skywalker, and as he left, Sidious just smiled to himself. Of course he didn't care about Anakin. The reality of the situation is he was being someone kind to him because he didn't fail. If he failed, this would be a much different relationship. Skywalker lived up to what he was supposed to be. Now it was all about prolonging his rule as Emperor, no matter what. Sidious turned over towards the children and looked down at them. They slept. They sat on the steps of his throne for the future of his empire. Within the coming days, Ryloth would have its worst struggle ever. The clones on the planet were completely curb stomped by the Yuzeng Vong. General Sindula barely escaped with his daughter, and the Imperial reinforcements arrived. The clones landed on the ground to engage with the Vong, and their battles were very bad. They fought with these creatures, but were torn apart. The people of Ryloth that continued to fight died nearly instantaneously, and the clones Palpatine sent to Ryloth were testing out their various powers. Each of them had one key power, one of them able to use telekinesis, another force lightning, others might be able to use speed or whatnot. All that mattered to Palpatine is that one of these specialty clones would shine through. The Force Lightning, for whatever reason, crippled the troopers of this species. 
the clones on the ground, and eventually the clones Palpatine sent, were all killed, which was a part of the plan. In space, the clone force in their Venators were being shredded by the Vong. They were able to hold their ground because of three years of active combat with these vessels and each other, but it wasn't enough against superior technology. However, when the Imperial Star Destroyer fleet arrived, it was a different story. The Empire had clearly lost the battle, but with the arrival of the Imperial fleet, it completely changed the tide of the battle. The Empire had already decidedly moved on from the clone trooper program, and the Senate collectively agreed with Palpatine on the move. However, just because the clones were no longer readily serving the front lines didn't mean Palpatine wouldn't sacrifice them as a show for a need of a military budget increase. What a joy. Killed two birds with one stone, except the second bird is the enemy creatures. What the Empire would develop in the coming weeks and months would only make this force regret ever coming to this side of the universe. Sidious was also fully aware of their weaknesses now, and would inform his officers of where to make the Imperial Stormtroopers aim. In this new Imperial military, there were the average grunts. They didn't get the shiny armor. Then there was the elite troopers. They got to be stormtroopers and upwards of ranks. Sidious wanted a good case for having them around. It turns out the Vong had gills under their arms, so if they were wearing helmets, it would do them well to have them killed by aiming for their underarms. Sidious, after the battle at Ryloth, which resulted in an Imperial rout, would display the footage to the Senate, informing them that the Empire would be spending a larger part of its budget on the military to fight off this alien attack. Every single drive route would go into heavy productions of Imperial 1 Star Destroyers and Victory 2 Star Destroyers. The Empire would defend itself from this external threat if they came together. The charismatic voice of the politician that was Palpatine never left, and it rallied support for his cause. The people were both split in fear and eagerness. The Empire began to lock down parts of the Mid-Rim, essentially allowing the Outer Rim to fend for itself, which, as the Vong realized, meant they could target outlining worlds, executing billions, and making their way up the trillions. The crime families tried to fight for themselves, but it was very quickly revealed that they needed an empire to survive. Without the empire, they were just children playing in a sandbox and the Vong was a flood. There was no one to save them, which for the Empire only proved more worlds should be loyal to them. For longtime Separatist worlds, they quickly acted on it, after every single Genosan was wiped off of Genosis. It was a slaughter, and while there were Imperial projects being worked on out there, it wasn't a big concern, none of them being too far in development anyways. Vader spent a number of days mourning the loss of his wife, and when he returned, Sidious simply dispatched him away. Sidious told his young student to allow the dark side to fuel him in his endeavors to defend the Empire. Vader saw this as a chance for redemption. However, the funniest part is, Sidious never informed Vader of the weak spots of these Yuzang Vong. Whether it be the gills, the faces, or the fact that electricity worked on them, he simply let Anakin go out there with himself in the hope that he would do something. Was Sidious hoping Vader died? That much? He didn't even know. He was split on it. The Force created the twins as a response to the growing threat of Anakin becoming his new self and Vader, so naturally as the twins grew, the Force would create another one to topple them. Sidious knew that toying around with the cloning would inevitably create that, however he still wanted to. He was interested in the Force and if he could control it, then the darkness would reign for eternity. Sidious intentionally put Vader into failing battlefronts. The Yuzang Vong had a force unlike any other. They migrated from another galaxy because their galaxy was no longer sustainable. Now, they were here to conquer, and Skywalker was defenseless against them, for the most part. The irony of the Vong invasion is it thwarted any inspiration for the creation of a rebellion. Rebels like Saw Gerrera were hunted down by the Grand Inquisitor and other elite troops, rather than grunts. Mostly because there was no Jedi to hunt, so what else would he do? Sidious also informed Vader that Grand Inquisitor wasn't skilled enough to be on the front lines with him, which was a half-truth. Sidious didn't care about the Grand Inquisitor, but he was a rabid cur, a basic level toy that he could spin whichever way he wanted. Grand Inquisitor was loyal, and that's all that mattered to Sidious, because both of them knew that he wouldn't ever be as powerful as Vader or the Emperor, so he was content with just being a servant of the Dark Lord. It meant he got to live. For the next year, Vader's strength would grow, but because of his metallic hand, he would never think of using electricity against the Yuzang Vong. He lost more battles in the span of a year than he did during the entire duration of the Clone Wars. This was also intentional. Sidious wanted Vader to feel like he couldn't do it without his master, which is why Sidious was present for their final fight against the Vong. They at this point had crossed the 1 trillion kill count threshold, 
but it was hard to earn. The Imperial military structure was built for war, and every vessel was meant to maintain terror. Imperial star destroyers were the bread and butter of the Imperial fight, stormtroopers were a dime a dozen, and most of the time Imperial officers would just orbital bombard or send bombing runs down on their own troops. It was a bloody war, and truthfully most Imperial ground troops died to their own leaders more than the enemy, but no one had to know that. On the planet of Naboo, right where everything in Palpatine's journey to the top started, everything would be completed. The final leg of the war was crawling here. The Vong crushed Crimson Dawn and the other criminal empires, leaving the Outer Rim in shambles. They couldn't break past Imperial lines, and that was fine. Sidious simply waited for the Vong fleet to arrive, and in his own moment of pride, to remind Vader who was really the boss, he shot off the most powerful array of dark side ever seen by Skywalker and maybe even the galaxy. The lightning cut through the sky and crippled every single ship the Vong had left. There was no negotiation with the Empire. If you attacked, you died. That simple. Vader watched in awe as their ships dropped from the skies and were picked off by Imperial Star Destroyers. It was a glorious celebration in Naboo. Like everything Sidious does, he wanted to show Vader why he was a Sith Lord. He let him fail for an entire year with no success, no accolades, nothing to show for, only for his master to show up and cripple the entire remaining force in one move. Sidious was ensuring his longevity. That's essentially what he was doing. He didn't want his pupil getting too excited. With the Vong gone, the only thing Sidious needed to worry about was Vader. But the irony of it is, he built such a trauma bond with his student that Vader couldn't break out of it, even if he wanted to. Vader was trapped in every single way shape, and form. Vader didn't blame Sidious for Padme's death. Everything that happened since the Clone Wars and Order 66 seemed to be positive. The galaxy united against a common foe and rose up together under his rule, and how could Vader want to turn on Sidious when after all this time, his children cared for him too? It left a bind in his heart. Of course, there were times when he thought he was more powerful than the Emperor and that he could overthrow him, but each time he felt that or thought that way, it bit him in the back. Every time he thought he was the greatest there ever was, he suffered a loss that he had to rely on Sidious for something in return. While it was nothing more than Sidious being a better mentor than Obi-Wan in Vader's eyes, it was all intentional. It was a sick intellectual and biological manipulation that Sidious fed off of, since Skywalker was just a boy. The simple sharing of words after Qui-Gon's death and then every interaction since then was leading to this moment. For the longer part of the next decade, everything would be quite uneventful. The children were in their preteens by this point, the Empire was prosperous under its militaristic regime, and new officers ruled over where Palpatine didn't need to. Vader was more loyal than ever before, and this was continued by Sidious. He made sure Vader stayed loyal. Each year, a new test, that if he couldn't overcome, he would be punished. Skywalker took punishment as his own failure, to better himself, and he saw his master as completely right in each scenario. Also, how could Vader hate someone who helped him raise his kids? Uncle or Grandpa Palps was Luke and Leia's favorite visitor, and they didn't even know why. They just knew he was the coolest cat around, and it kinda ate away at Vader. But what would he do? If he killed Sidious, the galaxy would turn on him, and his kids would resent him. Every time he thought about it, it sent himself into an existential crisis, which was a sugar-coated anxiety attack. Sidious's cloning projects made serious advancements in the first year, but since then, they stagnated a little bit. They were able to build up more functioning looking beings, but he ended up creating a number of clones who couldn't even use the force. So he released them into the galaxy like little wild animals, never naming any of them and hoping they would pass down the genes from Palpatine into a future child. For another couple years, nothing would actually transpire, until the Grand Inquisitor brought him a force user who he thought would be worth his time. His name was Ezra Bridger. He was the exact same age as Luke and Leia. He had a high midichlorian count, but nothing like Sidious's. It would be a work in progress, but there was no need to rush it. Palpatine had time. Truthfully, there was absolutely no reason and no one to challenge Vader or Sidious. Order 66 had already made them some of the best Sith the galaxy had ever seen, but they clearly cemented themselves as the best. Though Vader was kind of hoping that once Sidious expired, he'd be able to take over. Something that would never happen. Palpatine made sure of that. When Luke and Leia got to adulthood, their corruption came full circle, and they turned on their father. The tragedy is, Vader didn't want to kill his kids, but he simply, at this point in his life, 
couldn't actually be killed by them. He was just simply too powerful. Sidious manipulated the children into doing it without them knowing he was telling them to do it. All those samples he had from them when they were children, just infants, so helpless and defenseless, he just used them. And so while they were fighting, he showed up and ended the entire fight. And doing what again? Positioning himself as a hero of this family feud, resolving every issue that beset the family, and being the best grandpa the galaxy had ever seen. All of them saw it this way, and he completely ruined an entire generation of Skywalkers. On the bright side, the Outer Rim by this point belonged to the Empire, and well, the Empire was the most powerful faction ever seen. The Vong invasion gave reason for consistent military growth. It was just a way for the Empire to say, hey, remember that one bad thing that happened? We gotta be prepared if 20 times that thing happens. Cool? Okay, cool. It was just a very great agreement that only Palpatine agreed to. When the time seemed to come to an end for Sidious, everything was ready. His cloning projects were no longer failures. Of course, a couple people did have to die. Not a couple, more like a ton. For example, Omega, Crosshair, they were the first to go. Poor Omega, so young when she died as an experiment. Maul also died, but everyone knew that was coming because Sidious just had to keep using him till there was nothing left. And that still happened with Ezra Bridger as well. The time was now. And when Palpatine left Coruscant for a day, as an 80-some year old, he returned as a vibrant young man. He was quick on his feet, and his face was cleaner than Anakin's. The twins and Anakin were beyond confused, and he simply acted like nothing changed. While Palpatine could use any number of excuses, or twist his words in any number of ways, he went with the simplest one out of all of them. He told them he didn't want to look like he bit into 15 lemons permanently, and so he got a facelift to deal with it. Honestly, they didn't even judge him for the attack made on him by the Jedi, but he looked a lot more charming without the wretched scars. With Palpatine's plan complete, he would continue to manipulate future iterations of individuals, meant to retain the balance. He understood that the Force would continue to try and eradicate his power by sending new threats, and as the Skywalkers became naturally aligned on him, so would every other generation of Force user meant to restore the balance. Palpatine's poison would tarnish generations, and his rule would be eternal, watching new students come and go, while all the while building upon his powerful regime, the one he started for the longevity and the pride of the Sith. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Nanny Studios, Anakin003, Lemon Knight, Flan Vassence, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. If you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. I do a lot of cool things on there that are super duper cool. Otherwise, smash the like button. Let's talk about our story real quick. When I go dark on this channel, I don't hold back, you know? We do these Sith stories probably once every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks, and they're not frequent because they're really dark, you know? And I give Palpatine a lot of credit, but he's also like the main villain of the saga, all nine movies, so I kind of have to work with him and make him kind of play dumb because if he doesn't play dumb, then he wins all the time. And so when I make a story where I intend on him winning, I get to have a lot more fun with him being that mastermind. And this story is a perfect example of that. In this story, he is really just like, he's doing this, this manipulation thing that that completely is, 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 it's messed up. Let's just say that, it's, it's really not nice. And because he's doing that, he's completely overriding anything Anakin has to say against him and making Anakin literally build a trauma bond with somebody. Now, if you've ever been in a relationship or have a trauma bond with someone in a relationship, please look it up. Seriously, look it up, understand it, because it's not a healthy thing. What I was mentioning is a real thing that happens to people and that's why it makes it even crueler that it happened in the story. So, you know, parallel. Anyways, though, I don't really have much to say about this. I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.